I'm so excited that Ron Putnam is here this morning. And uh, Ron is a friend of, that, that's Alan Parsons right there, Ron. See, Alan? Ron, Alan and I graduated from Heritage High School in 1979, and Ron graduated in 1983. And uh, Ron worked at Faith Presbyterian Church when I was up at uh, Lookout Mountain Community Church, and he would come and be part of our services up there. We actually tried to hire Ron years ago to be our executive pastor, you know, of this huge deal that was going on. And God wrecked all of our plans because he called Ron to start this ministry in the Ukraine, right? That was around 2001. And uh, so Ron started uh, Slavic Christian Ministries in 2001, went and lived over in Ukraine for 11 years, right? Met his wife, came back here, pastored a couple churches, and uh, his wife is Katya, has three daughters, one of which is named Hannah, who's right here, so you should wave to your adoring fans. You can meet Hannah. And, uh, you know, when, when the whole thing happened in the Ukraine, I thought, gosh, this is such an awful deal. Um, and surely we should do something about it or be connected somehow. And of course, you can't be connected to everything. But then Ron sent me an email and said, hey, our group is connected over and I thought, there. And I thought, great, then I can help uh, connect Ron. And then Ron had a chance to come up here and speak. So the board said, yeah, that would be great. We would like to hear uh, more about the Ukraine and, um, and about Jesus, of course. So uh, Ron's going to be up here speaking in just a minute. Um, but you know what, maybe I could, maybe come up here right now real quick. Can, and we can just pray for Ron. Then we're going to have an offering and sing a song, but yeah, watch out so you don't break a leg. Yeah. So let, may, can I just say a prayer for you? And then this will count after the song, right? Okay, so the prayer will be effective after the song. <laughs> okay, yeah. It works that way, Alan. Okay, so God, I just thank you so much for Ron. I thank you for old friends. I thank you for your spirit that inhabits your temple and brings all these living stones together. Father, we bless Ron. We thank you for what you're doing uh, in and through Ron and uh, through his family. And Lord, we uh, pray that our hearts will be open to what you have to say to us through Ron. And uh, that, Lord Jesus, we would know that we are um, your body, both in the Ukraine, here, and even in Russia, Lord God, or especially in Russia. So, Lord, we bless Ron and thank you for him and look forward to hearing for what, to what you have to say through Ron. Amen. Amen. Thank okay. you. So right now, uh, normally, you know, in our, the way we used to do things, we'd pass the plate, but since COVID, we haven't been passing it, and I don't know if we'll do that again or not. But uh, in the back, there'll be, you'll see baskets, and there's two baskets as you leave. One is for our normal offering, and the other is for uh, Slavic Christian Ministries. So if you want to leave something for Ron's organization and Ron's connecting with pastors over there, all sorts of stuff. You'll hear a little bit about that. You can uh, write a check or whatever and put it in the basket and they make the checks to Slavic Christian Ministries, right? So um, right now, uh, let's just continue to offer ourselves as we worship and open our hearts to what God would have to say to us. Thank you, brother. Hello, Sanctuary. It's nice to uh, be here today and, and meet all of you. I, I want to say before I begin that um, you're so blessed by God to have a pastor like Pastor Peter. Yeah. Will you all agree with that? He, he, uh, he didn't mention this, and I'm, I'm going to just say it anyway, but... Uh, Whenever I had an opportunity, I would always try to be around Pastor Peter because he, he, he in my eyes, has been such an amazing man of God. Uh, I first ran into him when I was going to Cherry Creek Press. I was young. This is like 30 years ago. And he, um, he, he spoke at one of the retreats that I was at, and he used an illustration that I won't mention here. <laughs> But it was uh, something that resonated with me, and I remember it to this day. He's such a dynamic pastor and preacher and a man of God that I, I just love this man very much. So, Peter, thank you so much for, for letting me uh, be part of your life for 30 years one way or another. So thank you, brother. Uh, today, uh, 
I will be trying to do three different things in one sermon. So I'm going to try to make this relevant to you as well as be faithful to the scripture and try to weave in what is happening in Ukraine with some of the parallels uh, that we see in the book of Nehemiah. So uh, you're going to see me kind of toggle between two or three different things at the same time. And then at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you uh, a PowerPoint presentation about what's happening in Ukraine so it'll become a little bit more real to you. I know you've seen a lot in the news. I'll try to give you a little bit of behind the scenes as well, okay? But what I'm going to go ahead and do is uh, read the scripture of Nehemiah chapter 2 if you'd like to follow along. I, I will be um, referencing Nehemiah chapter 1 a little bit, but we won't read those scriptures, and I will read uh, the first uh, verse or two of Nehemiah chapter 3, if you want to keep your thumb there as well. And then I'll pray and then we'll begin. Sound good? So listen carefully. This is God's word for you today. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. This is Nehemiah speaking. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, what does your face, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very, sad, uh, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Now I'm going to go down to verse 11. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down, its gates had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate in the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had not said Anything said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or for that matter any any others Who would be doing the work? Then I said to them. Do you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire Come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I Also told them about the gracious hand my God put upon me and what the king had said to me, they replied, let's start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success with his servants will we his servants will start rebuilding best for you you'll have no share in jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it this ends the reading of god's word may he be given the glory and the honor let's say a quick prayer father jesus and holy spirit i just want to thank you that uh, we're all here together today i just want to pray lord that you allow every person here to receive what it is that you want them to hear and apply for their lives. But I pray that my words will be your words and you'll be glorified. It's in your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. P 
Peter can do this with just a piece of paper. Have you noticed with his notes? One thing I have not uh, been able to do is that. So I still have my, my notes in a, in a thing here. So let me ask you, uh, every one of you that's here, to make this a little personal for you, what is it that you're passionate about? What is it that you long for? What are some things that are the ideals that you embrace, hold to, adhere to? For example, what's your standard of perfection, the principle that you aim for, or something or someone that you try to emulate? What are those things that are very, very close to your heart? For some people, it could be our country, it could be the school system, it could be the COVID response, it could be a whole myriad of different things that you're passionate about. Perhaps it's theology, the Bible, the kingdom of God, the openness to worship. What is it that you're passionate about? And has anything ever gone sideways for you? My guess is if I asked for a, a raise of hands, everybody would, would say yes. Something has always gone sideways at one point or another in your life. The reality is that no one is immune to things going sideways. We all mourn something uh, that has happened in our lives. Whether it's the people way back in Jerusalem over 2,500 years ago when it was this beautiful city that was destroyed by the Babylonians, whether it's the people in Ukraine who have lost everything overnight, or whether it's something that happened in your life. Nobody is immune to mourning. There's personal tragedy, there's loss of loved ones, there's unfulfilled dreams that happen. Would we all, can I get an amen with that one? I was going to sing a song from Stephen Curtis Chapman this morning, but I thought since only frogs rejoice when I sing, I wouldn't do that to you today. But there is a line in one of his songs called We're Not Home Yet. Do you know this song by chance? I'm going to read one small stanza from that song. It said, all the travelers, we're all travelers, pilgrims longing for home. It's a long and winding road, but we're not home yet. You're blessed to have someone like Pastor Peter as your pastor, who's one of the best pastors I've ever met in my life, but we're not home yet, right? Because things happen in life. Why? Why does God allow wars to happen? Why does God allow tragedies to happen in your life? Why do things just go sideways unexpectedly? Well, there is this very obscure author named Ron Putnam, and he wrote this quote. We live in a fallen world where things break down, jobs are lost, families are broken, and wars begin. You may ask yourself, why? But God often allows us to be disappointed to see the grim reality of this fallen world in a way that in the end, we look only to God as our source of hope to whom we can trust. For he is good, all-knowing and an all-loving God who loves his people and accomplishes his purposes for his eternal glory. When we embrace this reality that we are not yet home, then we're free to appreciate all the goodness of God, all the provisions he does provide for us on a daily basis, and the care of continually, and, 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 and appreciating the care he continually gives. When we see this, then and only then does all the disillusionment fade as mist on a warm day. Let me paraphrase. God will use every situation in your life, good or bad for that matter, to bring you closer to him, if you allow it. Oh, you might be pushing away for a while, but God, if he's wooing you to himself, if he's drawn you to himself, then you will come closer to the heart of God, despite what's happening in your life. Psalm 42, verse 5 and 11, 
basically says the same thing. It says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for yet I will praise him. You are my Savior. That's verse 5. Verse 11, the psalmist says basically the same thing. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. No matter what you're going through, we have an opportunity to praise him, yes? We can look to him because he is our source. Lamentations, which we believe may have been written by the prophet Jeremiah. And by the way, if you didn't know this, Lamentations actually means funeral songs. So this was a really bad time in Israel's history. And if, and if uh, right after the total destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, this is what the author wrote, verses uh, 17 through 26 of Lamentations chapter 3. He says, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I, will, I, I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet, I, yet this I call to mind, and then for, therefore this is where I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. This sounds familiar, right? Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to be quiet for the salvation of the Lord. You see, when Ukraine was destroyed basically over the last two and a half months. People have been wondering why. Everything that they hoped for, everything they had tried to build over the last 21 years that I have been there just went away. And it's very easy for those who don't know the Lord to just be consumed by grief when they see that everything has been destroyed in their, in their cities and in their country. Oh, they're still very patriotic, patriotic with what's happening. But everything is gone. Their homes are gone. Their jobs are gone. Some of their loved ones are gone. But the church... In Ukraine, and I'll get to it more later on, is trying to still convey the hope of God to all of these people. They're trying to show the love of God despite the destruction. So whether it's the people in Jerusalem 2,500 years ago, whether it is the people in Ukraine today, or whether it is you, I want you to know that whatever it is you're going through, your pastor here will always convey the love of God to you. The pastors in Ukraine will always convey the love of God. Why? Well, in Nehemiah chapter 1, he was weeping, it says. It says he fasted and he prayed and he confessed the sins of his own family and himself, but as well as the country, because Israel and Jerusalem were totally destroyed. The walls were rubble. The gates were burned. Now, I always asked myself, why is it that, that Nehemiah, growing up in posh Babylon, being right next to the king, would be so surprised by this when he probably heard reports all the time? But when it says Hananiah, his brother, came back and, sh and said that the people are, are in great distress, it made Nehemiah mourn deeply. It wasn't just because Jerusalem was destroyed. It was because he loved God's people and he loved, he had a deep passion for, for his God. Now what you may not understand is you think, well, what's the big deal of walls being broken? Back, if you go back 2,500 years in time, Walls were actually symbolic of something else. Walls were symbolic of how big and how great your God was. 
It was not just a wall for safety, but it was some sort of symbolism that we are protected by our God. So even though that the temple, the second temple had been rebuilt in 515 B.C., and I'm not going to bore you with some of these dates, it took 70 years before Nehemiah came onto the scene to which he was basically interceding on behalf of himself and the people of God for their restoration with him, their relationship with him, and as an identity as a people. Now I want to make a connection here for you, please. The temple, the second temple had been built for 70 years, but the walls and the gates were still totally destroyed. So let me put this in today's vernacular. Oh, you can go to church, but you have no identity of what it means to be a child of God because you're serving an inferior God. And this made Nehemiah weep. Okay, how do I make this work? Um, how many are Broncos fans? You know what it's like to have to deal with a losing season for five years in a row. Oh, you love your Broncos! But we're part of a losing team. Something came to my mind when I was rereading this again last night to prepare. Do you remember the New Orleans Saints like 30 years ago? They were called the Aints, and people would wear like paper bags over their heads. Do you remember that? They are embarrassed to be Saints fans. This is kind of symbolic of what was happening here. They were going to church, but they had no power, they had no identity. And they were thinking to themselves, What's the point? Why rebuild if we have all these enemies all around us? You know, in the last two and a half months, we're, we're, we're partnering with six different pastors and churches in the Kharkiv area. Maybe you've heard of Kharkiv. We're on the far eastern side of the country. It's the second worst hit city in all of Ukraine. Before the war, it was about 1.5 million people, and now it's down to several hundred thousand. Uh, the, the town to which I used to live in had about a half a million people within a couple mile radius, and that whole area has been totally demolished. During that period of time, a um, couple of the pastors were partnering with. Uh, one one uh, pastor's house, he was actually in the kitchen with a couple other pastors, and a missile came in and destroyed his home. And the missile came through the, uh, the bedroom ceiling. And there was a living room between the bedroom and the kitchen. And if he had been in the bedroom or the kitchen, he would not be here today. Then there's another pastor that we partner with that um, I didn't even get to take a picture of it because it was just gone. It was totally demolished. His home was demolished. It was gone. It was just, it disappeared. <laughs> And a couple churches that we partner with as well have been hit by missiles. And one a missile did not hit it, but came nearby and it destroyed all the windows. And so my first re reaction was, oh my goodness, what am I going to do in this situation? How can I call them? Well, not really, I mean texting them, right? How can we help you? Do you need money now? What can I do now to help you? Do you, you need a home, you need a church. What can I do to help you? And their response to me was this. What's the point? Could just be destroyed tomorrow. Oh, Ron, there might be a time when you can help us, but not right now. What's the point? Missiles are coming constantly throughout the day. Could just be hit again. Was this the attitude of the Jews in Jerusalem? Why did they wait 70 years and, and not rebuild the temple or the, the walls or the gates? Was it an attitude of what's the point? See, Nehemiah had a passion not just for Jerusalem and not just for the people. He had a passion for people's faith in the God that they believed in. He wanted the people to have the favor of God 
and God to forgive them and to bless them. He wanted them to have a renewed faith and a commitment to God to have to overcome national shame and have an identity once again as God's people and have a self-esteem that's not like New Orleans Saints fans, Denver Bronco fans, or just defeated people. So what happens is Nehemiah gets this passion. He asks the king, the king gives him favor, gives him the supplies, say, you do what you need to do, go complete the task. So he goes back. And all of chapter 2 is him surveying the situation. He looks at how everything is destroyed, just like everything in Ukraine right now, except it's not just one city. It's the entire south and east of the country. Anyway, Nehemiah looks at everything, reviews, analyzes the situation, and then he says the obvious that everybody knows. You're in trouble. No, we're in trouble. He includes himself. Don't you see the walls are destroyed and the gates are burned? He cast the vision to the people, the people that have been living in the rubble for 70 years. And he says, let's rebuild so that we will no longer be in disgrace. And when he cast the vision to everybody, what was the response? They said, let's start rebuilding. Now, Nehemiah, he gave vision and hope and a sense of pride and purpose and inspiration. And it happened. They rebuilt the walls. It took 52 days to not just rebuild the walls and rebuild the gates and bring back a national pride, despite the controversy of enemies next to them constantly, they were still able to rebuild the rubble in 52 days. Let me amend that. 52 days and 70 years. So I want to ask you today, for you, what is the rubble in your lives? What is it that needs to be rebuilt? Are you letting it just live there and you're not doing anything about it? Give it to God. Trust God. He will rebuild what the locusts have eaten. Anyway, back to Ukraine. I can tell you, friends, that it lies in ruins. I told you there's destruction everywhere. The Russian army has destroyed schools and hospitals and nursing homes and residential areas, and we have people crying out to us. There is a Russian missile that hit a retirement home because, you know, they are a danger. <laughs> 400 people were living there. And one of the churches we partner with is now feeding all 400 of those people. Before the war happened, we, we did a lot of various ministries. I mean, we worked with orphans and disabled children and rehab and taught theology in dozens and dozens of churches. We helped with refugees and from the 2014 war, and we've done a whole bunch of things. Um, most of the orphans were shipped out to other countries and the war began, thank God, right? But since the war began, uh, there's 70 new orphans that we're taking care of just in Kharkov. Well, not us, the, the partners. We asked them, is there anything we can do to help you more with that? Because, you know, what can we do to help? We got it wrong. We're taking care of it. But 70 new orphans. About 300,000 people have lost their homes just in our city of Kharkiv alone. 2,200 buildings have been destroyed, about 20% of the entire city. Not quite the size of Denver, but think of 20% of Denver destroyed in the last two and a half months. 
But the people have this national pride. It's not like the Jerusalem Jews way back when where they had lost their national pride. The people of Ukraine still have a deep national pride, and 93% of them believe that victory is still at hand, even though that they're the David and the Russians are the Goliath. And 89% of the Ukrainians say that we do not want to even talk about uh, any, any type of truce until every Russian has left our land. That's a resolute, resolute spirit. Zelensky, who's the president of Ukraine, said on May 9th is when they, both Russia and Ukraine celebrate the defeat of the Nazis in World War II. Uh, Zelensky gave his speech to the Ukrainians on that day, and this is what he said. He said, there's nothing more dangerous than an insidious enemy, but there's nothing more poisonous than an insincere friend, said a great Ukrainian philosopher. On February 24th, when the war began, he said, we realized this truth when an insincere friend started a war against Ukraine. On the day of victory over Nazism, we are fighting for a new victory. The road to victory will be difficult, but we have no doubt that we will win. I hope he's right. Will they win? Will God give Ukraine success like he did to the Jews? I've had people say to my face, well, the Ukrainian president came from a bad past and Ukraine's a corrupt country, so maybe they deserve this. Well, that made me cranky for a day or two. The way I read the book of Isaiah, it says God's upset with all the nations, not just one. But does... But whatever the case may be, will it be something that will draw the Ukrainians back to God? Despite losing everything and rubble being everywhere, can they still win this war? Can they rebuild their lives? Well, I can tell you right now that the Ukrainians kept the Russians out of Kiev, as you probably saw in the news. But I can tell you that in a suburb called Bucha, a thousand people were murdered. Another suburb of, of, of uh, Kiev called Irpin, which I've stayed in, totally wiped off the map. Gone. But I can tell you this, that the Ukrainians are pushing back the Russians, despite the overwhelming odds that Russia should be, this war should have been over a long time ago. Um, I'm sad to say that there has life been lost on both sides, and the Ukrainians are not really telling us what the losses are, but they are telling us that 30,000 Russians have been killed, which that mourns me, even though they're the invaders, because a lot of these are just 18, 19-year-old kids, not much older than my daughter here. They didn't even know they were going to war. So half of them are disillusioned. The other half are angry, but the reality is there's loss of life on both sides. But the Ukrainians have destroyed about 1,200 tanks, 200 planes, a plethora of hardware, and they continue to make small advances. But this is really going to be a war of attrition, friends. This isn't going to be over tomorrow. And it's all focused on the eastern side of Ukraine, right where we're at. Thankfully, I can report to you as of today that the only area that we've really pushed back is around our city. <laughs> so praise God, right? The people at least we know and love are in a much better position. But will God, will, will God be on Ukraine's side? I can't answer that. Zelensky believes so. But whether they win or whether they lose, I don't know. But I can tell you this, that those who are doing God's work are the pastors all across the country, not just in our area. I want to read something to you from uh, Nehemiah chapter 3. I, I told you I was going to read one or two verses here. I'll, I'll just read one. I want you to know if you ever run out of melatonin <laughs> and, and, and you can't sleep at night, just read Nehemiah chapter 3. It will really help you. 
but because all it is is just a listing of all of the names of all of the Jews that helped rebuild the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. But what I want to point out that you may have passed by many times before, if you've read the Bible many times, is verse 1. And here is what it says. It says, Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated as far as the Tower of the Hananel. Why is that important? What I want to point out to you is when Nehemiah cast the vision and the people said rebuild, it was the high priest and the other priests that took the lead and said, let's do this. Let's rebuild. And that's exactly what's going on in Ukraine. It's the Ukrainian pastors that are working tirelessly around the clock to help feed the people, to get them medicine, get them the supplies, just to survive. And before they give anything, they preach God's word. And they hand out Bibles. And you'll see one small, uh, if it comes up, one small video at the end, where the people are captured by the message. It's not like, okay, I just want the food and I want to go. They're listening. Oh yeah, we're helping them survive financially by giving them money and then they're buying food and supplies and I'd like to convey to you, praise God, that the six partners we're partnering with just in the city of Kharkiv have helped feed about 150,000 people in the last two and a half months. We are also helping orphans in Romania that are Ukrainian, and we're helping other pastors and mission agencies in other parts of the country, and we're partnering with about 60 different families, helping keeping them alive. But really, the, most of the work we do is in the city of Kharkiv. And I'm so proud of these people. And before I forget, Eliashib, the high priest, his name means God restores. In Israel, it took 52 days and 70 years. I don't know how long it's going to take to rebuild Israel, or Israel, Ukraine, excuse me, because the war's still going on. But I can tell you that as long as the pastors have breath in their lungs, They'll continue to proclaim the good news. They'll continue to point people to Christ. And the last report I heard is they're ha still having church services, and they've tripled. Praise God, right? But let me finish by saying that Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, he prayed 14 times in that book, even though he was God, uh, God's. Well, he was God's representative, but he was also the king's representative. Even though he was given all of the supplies by the king, he knew that nothing would come to pass. No success would, 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 uh, would come unless he got on his knees and prayed. He knew it was all on God. God was the one who was going to bring the success. He was just the vessel. And so... Whether Ukraine wins or loses, I don't know, but I just know that we as God's people can help our brothers and sisters in Ukraine by continuing to pray for them, realizing God is the one who can stop this war, can rebuild the lives of the people, whether it's the Ukrainians or whether it's the mothers and fathers who've lost their loved ones in Ukraine or Russia. But I want to thank you, Pastor Peter, for allowing me to just share briefly about what happened in Jerusalem many years ago. There are some similarities between what happened then and, and what's happening now. Let's pray that the loss of life will stop soon. Let's pray that the people who are in rubble can rebuild their lives. And my, my request to you today is whatever's in your life, that needs to be rebuilt, give it to God. He can restore you in every area where something went sideways. But 
if you would, please continue to pray for those in Ukraine. Pray for those who are just trying to survive. It's been 90 some odd days. They're still living in bunkers. Okay, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little more real with the slideshow. We'll make this quick. Thank you for allowing me to share that part. You can go ahead and proceed. This begins with pictures of the destruction of Kharkiv, where the war began February 24th. Again, this is a city of 1.5 million people before the war. I've actually seen where cluster bombs went off eighth of a mile from where I used to live. Huge missile went off a couple hundred yards from my wife's mother's home. She's now a refugee living on a mattress in an elementary school an hour away from the city, just like millions of others. These pictures of the bomb shelters, forgive me that they're fuzzy, but this is what they gave me, that they just don't have clear uh, cameras. Uh, this is um, children and adults of all ages that have to go down to these bunkers. They get to go out for about an hour or two per day to get food, to try to find food, to whatever it is that they, um, they need to do. Sometimes the missiles still come. This guy right there was our theology teacher for about 10, 12 years. He's here in a bunker. His name's Kostya. This family right here, he was one of my students at Donetsk Christian University, which was taken over in 2014 by the Russians. They kicked all the, Rus the uh, Christians out of our, our, our um, college campus and took it over. Uh, anyway, he moved to Irpin. Um, I lost track of him for years. You can see I saw him again. He has lots, lots of kids. So, well done. But um, he was living in Irpin, and because he, uh, excuse me, not Irpin, Bucha, and uh, one of the suburbs of Kiev. And uh, because he had such a large family, they said, we think you need to leave uh, and go across the border. So they they had this volunteer put them in a van and, and actually take them to Lviv, which you probably heard of in western Ukraine, and then they crossed the border and went to Germany. So I, he was one of the people we highlighted a month or two ago, and I asked him recently, um, any news from Bucha? Did, did everybody survive that, that you know back in that town because they murdered a thousand people? He said um, the person that was driving them went back to, to, to take more people, you know, from Bucha back to the western part of the uh, Ukraine. And he said that she was killed um, by some, some way. I don't know if it was a missile or a shell. I, I'm not quite sure what. But what was interesting is he was telling me is as they were leaving Bucha to go to Lviv, they were all looking in the rear view mirror or turning behind them to look. And literally within about 15, 20 seconds after they left, massive amount of bombs came down. So God spared their lives. This is them in Germany in a, a refugee camp. This is not World War II. This is my city of Kharkiv in the beginning of the war. People frantically trying to get out of the city because of all the bombs and missiles. I should mention that, um, you can keep going with the, with the pictures. Um, I should tell you that our, our partners we partner with not only give food and medicine and supplies, but they've also evacuated thousands and thousands of people by minibus, uh, vans, however, however they can get people out. That's my mother-in-law on the left. This is a, you'll see this maybe in the video, but this is a standard line of people waiting for food. They'll wait for hours just for a bag of food that weighs about five pounds. A 
a lot of the elderly stayed behind because they have no money or they don't have the health or they just don't have anywhere to go. I, I inserted this just to lighten the mood a little bit. That's one of our workers on the right. He's been employed by us for over a decade. That's one of our workers on the left su supplying lots of supplies. He's, his name's Peter. He, so we have different ministries do different things. Most of them give food, and, and, but some give refugee assistance. Some give medical aid. Uh, he, he's the one that gives the medical aid. I told you about um, the pastor's home that was hit by a missile. This is a picture of his roof. That's his living room. I told you there's 70 new orphans that have been become orphans in the last two and a half months. Here are a few of them. Again, they're fuzzy, but this is just the best camera they had. This guy's a volunteer from one of the churches to which we partner with. I have a strong feeling we might be hiring this guy once the war's over. And just like in Nehemiah chapter 3, it's the Christians who are supplying, supplying the word of God, the love of God, and the tangible things like food and water and medicine and supplies. They're taken in wherever they can get. You can stop there for a second, please. They, they'll take whatever they can get. Uh, they tried to get a lot of food packages in, the, in, the, you know, in a room this size and put them all in different areas and then get everybody you know, a bread, a, a loaf of bread or something else, you know, like uh, carrots or, or cabbage or, or something else, and they put them all into one bag. But that's not always the case, and so they just give whatever they can give in the back of their cars, man, vans, or mini trucks. It's not as bad as it, now as it was early in the war, but the food was running out very quickly. And some of these pastors had to drive eight hours one direction just to find food and bring it back. This is um, one of the pastors of a mega church that we partner with. He's helping guide and direct all the volunteers. It's not, you understand, to feed 150,000 people, pastors can't do it themselves. So they have people within the congregation, people like you, that say, I'll use my car, I'll use my van, and then they, they use them to help distribute. He, he, when he's not helping guide all of that, he's cooking. He's probably talking to me at this point right here. I'm joking, I don't know. But, uh. So people like you have helped pay for all of this. These are pastors and, and volunteers praying before a food distribution. See the guy in the blue jacket to the right where his, um, his face is, is facing us? That's the, his name is Pastor Sergey. He's the one whose uh, house was hit by the missile. They have to wear, these are the volunteers of the different churches that are distributing the food. You notice they're wearing the... Um, bulletproof vest because yes the Russian army is shooting at them they don't the Russians are not stopping um, free passage for anybody who has like a red cross on it or anything pastor um, Peter had mentioned about Pastor Sasha in Ukraine that it was in one of my latest updates. Um, he, he, as far as I'm aware, he, he didn't do this, but he was taking care of people in his town. He had a Baptist church of about 200, 250, 300, something like that. And uh, honestly, we were not able to get a hold of him. We wanted to get resources to him because we've been in partnership for 20 years, but we couldn't get a hold of him until we found out from someone in his church that was in Germany that, um, that he had been arrested and beaten and beaten so bad that he needed a hospital, but they wouldn't release him. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he was close to death or not, but as of last night, he is in a hospital. So praise God for that.
This is one of the pastors here that is not in Kharkiv, but we partner with him and his minister in southwestern Ukraine, and he is a military chaplain, and he's ministering and serving the Ukrainian military. And I can tell you by, by what he tells us that they are woefully lacking in, in things like medicines and, and supplies. So he's trying his very best to, um, to help them. Okay, now that's the end of the pictures. We have two videos if those will work. Oh. Will that run if you do the right click? While they're um, trying to make the video work, um, these are people that are going, it's the, you can't see it all, but it's a long line of hundreds of people. It was raining that day, we don't have it, okay. Uh, and what the pastor was trying to convey to us in this video was um, that the people had been waiting for three to four hours in the rain just to get this food. They said, we can't get the video. You can go to the next one then. And here, this video probably isn't going to work either. But um, this is, you can't see his face here, but he's one of the partners we've had, one of my employees for many years. And he's preaching the word of God. I wish this would have worked because you would have seen how they're captured by his preaching the good news. And, and then after they preach the good news, that's when they distribute the food. So let me just say thank you for letting me, Pastor Peter, to come and speak a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine. I wish I could bring more good news, but I, I, I know that we're all the body of Christ, right? And we're here um, to support our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, even if it's just by prayer. Um, I just want to thank you for letting me share a little bit today. But I hope and pray that um, this war ends soon. And I hope and pray that whatever God will rebuild in your life, um, you'll, you'll cling to his promises as well. Amen. So let me go ahead and close in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you so much for this beautiful church and these beautiful people. And I thank you for all of the freedoms that we have here in America uh, compared to what's going on around the world. We just pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And I just want to thank you, Lord, that you've given such brave pastors to lead and pave the way to bless your people. I pray for not only lives to be saved physically, Lord, I pray for salvation to happen throughout all of Ukraine as well, no matter what the outcome. But thank you for the sanctuary church and their hearts to be willing to hear this message. I pray, Lord, for every person here, whatever is happening in their lives, I pray, Lord, you build, rebuild their, their walls as well. Take the rubble out of their lives and just bless them. Let them see you like they never have before. It's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much. You're welcome, brother. So, for Ryan, you can tell that's all very fresh. And you all have the whatever you're experiencing that's very fresh. And then that question um, so, what's the point? <laughs> Well, this is always the point. On the night that he was betrayed. Now, now let me just stop right there for a second. Why was he betrayed? <laughs> because from the foundation of the world, God decided that he would be betrayed. But he was also betrayed by a guy named Judas. And the name comes from, from, from Jew. We didn't work this out, but if I pick up the story, I mean, Nehemiah was about what? Do you remember about what year that was? Yeah, it was about 450 BC. A couple hundred years later, the Jews go back, they rebuild the temple. A couple hundred years later, Antiochus Epiphanes and the Greeks come and they destroy the temple. 
then it gets rebuilt again, and then this guy named Yeshua starts showing up, and there's just wild enthusiasm that he will rid um, Israel of the Romans because the Romans are threatening their society, but Jesus starts talking about the temple being destroyed. And there's a good chance that Judas betrayed Jesus to force a lot of issues, and the anger with Jesus is, um, they're saying, Jesus, uh, if, you, if, you don't, if we don't rebel against the Romans, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? So remember, he comes in on Palm Sunday, and what, there's a million people there for the Passover chanting um, that he's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Uh, he goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple and he prophesies its destruction. Everybody's going, what is the point? What is the point? What is the point? And then the night that he's betrayed, he takes the bread and he breaks it and he says, this is my body given to you. There are 12 guys sitting around the table like the 12 tribes of Israel he says, this is my body given to you, and this, is, this cup is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says, drink of it, all of you. And in the morning, they kill him, nail him to the tree. And as he's on the tree, he delivers up his, his spirit. And that's the spirit that falls on the church at Pentecost and all those people speaking all those different languages. Within one generation, uh, Jerusalem is leveled, like Jesus said it would be, just plowed into the, plowed into the ground. Uh, but that church starts to grow, and it grows into you and into me. And then in the Revelation, John has a vision, and he sees a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And that Jerusalem isn't made out of stone. It's made out of this. It's made out of the thing that you saw in the video at the end of the presentation. It's made out of people holding hands in a circle and fixing food for each other. It's made out of your prayers as you pray for people in the Ukraine, or maybe uh, put a little bit of money in the offering plate, or maybe just have a little bit of compassion. You see, it's made out of love, and that's the point. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself, gave his son as atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then that's the very thing that inhabits us as God himself knits people together. And it turns out that Denver is going to be reduced to dust and ashes. The Denver Broncos are going to lose. Hopefully they'll win a couple of Super Bowls before they ultimately lose. Uh, Ukraine will be reduced to dust and ashes. Russia will be reduced to Russian ashes. We will be reduced to Russian ashes. But, but when John saw the new Jerusalem coming down, he also saw a new heaven and a new earth. <laughs> God says, yeah, you, all, you put it together, put it together, but in the process of putting it together, I'm gonna teach you how to um, put each other together. I'm gonna teach you how to love. So as you come to the communion table this morning, and you come bringing all your broken pieces of maybe what's been blown apart, the evil one will whisper to you, there is no point, and God has abandoned you. And the Holy Spirit whispers to you, no, this is the point. You're surrendering to love and you're learning to love, and that love is eternal. That's the new Jerusalem coming down, and one day you'll see it with your eyes. Um, uh, it cannot be destroyed. And you'll see it with new bodies. you see a new Denver, a new Ukraine, a new Russia. Um, and everyone will be singing and worshiping Jesus. He's the point. So we invite you to come forward, take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and ingest the point into this body of dust and ashes. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Lord God, thank you that you will lead us to those around us, that you will fill us. I thank you, Lord God, that your plans are so much greater than our plans. We want to rebuild the city of Kharkiv, the city of Denver. We want to rebuild our house. We want to make our, our life work. And lo and behold, um, you are making us your life. And you are building us into something that's eternal and cannot be shaken, cannot be broken. 
And in Jesus, it's even already happened. So, Lord God, may we manifest your kingdom on earth in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, thank you, Ron. And uh, Ron will be around for a little bit after, after the service. Right now, the watch party is going to continue in about 15 minutes down, downstairs. But we invite you to stick around, uh, talk to Ron if you'd like. If you'd like to leave something for the Ukraine, um, you can do it by putting in the, one of the baskets there uh, by the door, all right? But by way of benediction, uh, believe the gospel. In other words, believe that God has loved you that Jesus did that for you, that he gives himself to you. Believe that you are loved and you will love, and that love is indestructible. In Jesus' name, amen.